Welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 318th New Social Environment. I am Jess Chen, events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Dominique Fung and Jessica Holmes. We're also thrilled to have the poet Ty Cooper here who will read to close today's program. We've started all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we are on the Nape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lani Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom and recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and host, New York-based artist, Dominique Fung, received her BAA from Sheridan College Institute of Technology and Design in Oakville, Canada in 2009. Her current solo exhibition, It's Not Polite to Stare at Jeffrey Deitch, New York, will be on view through June 26th. And she's joined by New York area-based writer, editor, and critic, Jessica Holmes. Um, who has been featured regularly in Bomb, Hyperallergic, The Observer, and The Brooklyn Rail, where she also edits the Art, the Art Tonic column. From 1999 to 2018, she worked for the Calder Foundation, including six years serving as its deputy director, where she wrote and lectured widely on Alexander Calder's life and work. Jess, take it away. Thank you, Jess, and thank you to everyone for being here today, and um, especially Dominique for joining me for this conversation, which I think is going to be wonderful, and I'm looking forward to diving in. Uh, as Jess mentioned, Dominique's current show up at Jeffrey Deitch is um, a, a survey of her most recent work called It's Not Polite to Stare. And to get started today, um, we thought we would ground everyone that is here with us um, in a sort of little walkthrough of the exhibition. Um, so Dominique, welcome. Thank you, Jess. Um, looking forward to this conversation. I, uh, so most of my work is pretty intuitive. So when I had initially started planning for the show, um, there wasn't really uh, like a strict direction that I wanted to go. And I actually um, began reading about um, superstitions. Uh, there's a book that I began to read. It's called The Science of Superstitions by um, Bruce M. Hood. And um, there was this, this small drawing in the book that talked about um, Dr. Charles Rush and Russ and how he was trying to measure um, uh, the frequency of a gaze. So if somebody was to look into this box, um, he could actually measure the gaze. And so over several years of doing this, um, uh, I think the conclusion was that he, he couldn't um, for certain say that whether um, there was like a presence of a gaze. However, I think um, thinking about the show, I was thinking about how um, the gaze really does reinforce the idea that um, looking at somebody or something is not a passive exercise and it can actually change the subject um, that is being gazed at. And so um, thinking about that, I was looking at um, old antique objects um, so from the front room to this room, um, you know, I then uh, started looking at physical, physical sculptures and I came across this bird cage that's in the center that's hanging in the center of the room. Um, and from this large bird cage, I then uh, found these smaller, smaller cages, which is in, a, in the secondary room. So if we can just maybe scroll forward. Um, and as, so from the bird cages, I then made this first painting here in the center, right here, um, with a woman who's looking at, uh, an object in the bird cage. 
And then that led me to the painting that's actually beside that painting. Um, and so generally I work uh, on a single piece at a time. So maybe if we just go forward one slide. Yeah. To the um, this was the second last painting, this large one, um, this diptych. It's the largest painting that I've done to date. Um, and then the one on the right is the last painting that I did for the show. The, the walls are actually, um, they look slightly greener on the screen. I think in person, they're a little bit more gray and the floors are a little bit more green actually. And I wanted this so sort of cohesive, feeling from the floor to the ceiling. Um, in these photos, the floor does look a little bit lighter. That was something that struck me when I was walking through the show is that the choice of the wall color really underscored um, the palette that you used in most of these works that you're showing. Um, and it creates a very like, um, all-encompassing, immersive sort of feel in this room. Mm -hmm. I wanted this sort of gray green undertone to the walls. Um, I didn't want it to be overbearing, but I still wanted, I, I didn't want the white walls. Right. Did, did you want to go ahead to the um, installation room and talk about this? Sure, I mean, I think it's coming up. Yeah. Yeah, so the this room, um, it's a it was a perfect size to um, to completely wallpaper it. it. The wallpapering was something that I've um, I've been thinking about a lot and that I've I've wanted to do for a while now. Um, thinking about you know Chinoiserie print and how um, the French and Europe had taken a lot of these. Um, uh, you know, Chinese motifs and made a very specific, uh, you know, even, you know, uh, for example, uh, fashion houses like Gucci, um, they're still doing it to this day. And I, for me, I wanted to play with that a little bit. And so I, we don't have a good photo of it um, in these slides, but if you look close up, you know, from a distance, you just see these cranes and these sort of flower pattern, uh, almost like lily pads. But if you actually go up closer to the wallpaper, uh, you know, some of the cranes, one, you know, has its head decapitated, two of them are fornicating, um, you know, a, a couple of them are uh, <laughs> urinating, and um, there's a teapot that's looking at itself. Um, um, and so for me, I just wanted to like disrupt the, the viewer um, from if you if you were to approach it closely. Right. Yes, I was I was really struck by the wallpaper actually. Um, I found it, you know, it was surprising once you start really examining it. And I also found a lot of humor in it. Um, is that something, um, I, were you thinking about um, humor at all or is that something that plays into your work? Definitely, I think, um, you know, I love, uh, the sort of tongue in cheek, I sort of like poking and making fun of. Um, I think a lot of my the a lot of my practice is there's just so much um, existentialism and sort of this heaviness in it. And so sometimes I just need to, um, you know, in a way almost um, make fun of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, and so even the sculptures sort of they sort of do that, the one that's in the center, and we'll, we'll go into more detail about it later, but, you know, one of them is, is smoking, and, um, you know, the, the glasses, there's like a pair of glasses in one of the bird cages, and, um, you know, you, you, you know, as you're looking into it, there's mirror, mirrors, and so it's looking back at you, and so a lot of my work is um, playing with that, um, the sort of the subject of the work is looking back at you. Back at you. Yes. Yeah. Great. Right. Go to the next slide. 
So to sort of take it back a little bit, um, this is a painting from uh, 20, 2020 from your last show. And uh, I thought we would spend a little time talking about um, where this current work sort of has evolved from. Um, so to, to begin here with material manifestations in the act of remembrance, um, also a large diptych painting, um, what are some of the, the seeds from this body of work that we're about to look at that, um, that you know, you've evolved um, the present work from? So I think this work was the first time that I really began um, sourcing references from directly from um, auction catalogs, from the Met, from uh, these sort of European institutions um, and, and sort of grappling with the idea of uh, a lot of these objects ha having been displaced, you know, uh, looted, taken from its original origins, mm -hmm. um, and somehow placing them into a setting so that they have their own existence and narrative. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit of me drawing upon looking at these objects, but then also um, thinking about storytelling, uh, narratives, and, and also film. Film sort of plays, it plays uh, a, a, a big part in my image making. Um, what films were you um, thinking of at this point? Uh, for, for this painting particularly, I mean, I don't know if it fully translates, but um, you know, I was watching a lot of uh, Jubilee animations, mm -hmm. um, specifically you know, Spirited Away, mm -hmm. um, to sort of have that, I think I was grasping for that sort of whimsical feeling. Mm -hmm. um, while uh, having the sort of undertone of like the sort of seriousness in the work. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's also sort of a surreal quality to it too, with the inside the vase, the um, like the the bodies. It's a little bit hard to see in this in this um, image, but the bodies are like this the creeping souls that are sort of tangled in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was really uh, uh, shaken to my core when I had saw um, uh, Dor. Dorothea Tanning's work at, at the Tate. Uh, I think it was a couple of years back, pre pre pandemic, and um, there was just when I saw her work, there was, and I, I I had known about her, but I don't think I had really um, gone through her uh, sort of her you know her retrospective and and you know her body of work encompassing like years of of her practice, and um, I felt this kinship to the way that she was making these images with sort of like the, um, the sunflowers and uh, these sort of just dis very displaced uh, rooms and objects. Um, um, and so I, 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 you know, I was probably channeling some of that. I mean, I was very inspired by her show, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially her self sculptures. Mm -hmm. um, But yeah, I mean, surrealism definitely um, plays a role in my work. Right. Shall we move to the next? And then here um, are two of your vase paintings. And you mentioned a, a couple of minutes ago that this is sort of the moment where you really began um, sourcing from different uh, catalogs and exhibition materials and things. Can you talk so a little bit? This, this is actually from before, this is pre, this is before this, uh, the last piece. Okay. Um, yeah. For these works, actually, I, so before making these works, I had actually been really interested in portraiture. Um, mm -hmm. I was painting these portraits of, um, you know, uh, East, 
East Asian women, Southeast Asian women. And I wanted to talk about this fetishization um, that happens just existing in the bodies that we do. And I had painted up one of my friends in this Ikea blanket, just a regular, um, you know, nothing special about this Ikea blanket. And she, her, her face was covered by it. And I wanted to talk about how, you know, even by covering yourself with a nondescript um, blanket that uh, you can still be orientalized. Mm -hmm. And uh, the painting ended up, selling to this white woman who was very enthusiastic about the painting. And then she asked me what the painting was about. And so I told her, I'm like, it's just this Ikea blanket. And she was, you know, very saddened by my description and said, oh, well, I thought it, I thought it was this beautiful silk gown that she had overlaid on top of her. And, you know, I sort of wish, um, I sort of wish I didn't know that that was what your thought process behind the work was. And, um, you know, I, I went back to the studio and um, I didn't know what to do with myself. I, you know, I thought I was being fairly straightforward, but maybe I, maybe it wasn't. And I realized that for me painting portraiture or like a full figure um i wasn't able to describe uh this sort of this sense of uh sexualization this fetishization and i think through objects i'm actually able to discuss this mm -hmm. a lot better right yeah a lot of people um talk about and Anne Lin Chang's um, idea of ornamentalism when they're speaking about your work. Um, is that uh, a text that has become important to you or um, how, how do you For see sure. it situated? Um, so I, I had actually made these paintings and um, a writer came into the studio and asked me if I had actually read her essay mm -hmm. and I hadn't at that point and um, you know, after reading uh, ornamentalism, it, there was just so much uh, clarification and clarity to what I was grasping for. Was this this sort of um, objecthood of the subject, uh, especially when when you know this is all you see in media, mm -hmm. in literature, in um, you know the way that images are presented um, to us. And so therefore you're rendered into this, this uh, for me, this is the best way to describe um, this feeling. Right. Shall we move to the next? I'm really interested in these two works, um, especially um, in light of the works to come in the current show, because there's a very um, clear notion of, you know, um, looking and being looked at, and also the objects looking back. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about these. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wanted to... Um... So it, 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 they initially started off as uh, boots and then I, you know, vase boots and they had toes and um, I realized that it would actually be a stronger um, idea image if they were just fully encompassing the object of the vase and the legs would just be coming out of it. Um, I was thinking a lot about, uh, again, like these fashion houses that have appropriated um, a lot of these textiles um, from East Asian culture, um, as well as sort of the appetite that the, you know, Europe has had um, for this aesthetic. Um, and yes, going back to, you know, this audience that's looking at this Right. this catwalk and then us as the viewers looking at the painting looking at the audience looking at the 
object, right. person. Yeah. 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 You're touching on fashion is interesting to me because fashion is something I think, you know, in um, like in our contemporary life that um, that pulls from Asian cultures. So, you know, liberally, sometimes thoughtlessly. Um, and you're really in your work, I, I see you kind of responding to to those notions in fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the conversation I think I'm, I'm grappling with is, is uh, appropriation, right? Like when, when, how far can you push it before it becomes, uh, you know, distasteful, it's not okay. You know, can we share, can, how much can we share a culture? How much of culture can we share? And these are all questions that, you know, I don't have answers for, but it's something that I'm thinking about a lot. Great. And then the next slide, Jess. So this- so the, the, the two paintings that, that are coming up are actually, uh, I made at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I, 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 I wasn't sure if I wanted to make works directly, like, you know, talking about it, but I think I was just in a, in a place of, you know, complete despair. I didn't know what to do with myself. So I felt like maybe I should try to, you know, contend with some of these feelings that I was having. Um, this piece is called uh, Stay Home. You know, it was the, the, the first time when, um, you know, you heard uh, Governor Cuomo, you know, tell us to stay home. Um, and so for me, this is, you know, me being trapped indoors. This was also before I had a studio. So I was actually working in my living room. Um, and not much uh, separation of work and home life, I guess. <laughs> no, yeah. And then, and then my, also my partner was then working at home and it just became a little bit claustrophobic. Um, did your did your practice by necessity have to change at all last year yeah so I moved into a studio that uh last September um mm -hmm. because of just the sort of the scale of the work um because I'm working a little bit larger and then mm -hmm. uh not having you know I had this additional space with my partner is now working in that additional space and so it just became uh a little bit too stressful to be working at home. And so right. I, I got a studio, yeah. Yeah, I can sort of in this painting feel the claustrophobia with its tight, um, you know, with its tight, uh, um, uh, sorry, it's it's tightly composed and, um, and with the staring into the little fishbowl, um, it there's a there's just a sense of um, containment, and um, there's with a little bit of a, a foreboding underscoring. Should we move to yeah, there? for sure. And then just like you know, the alarm clock. It's this, it's this loop. I call it the loop that we're existing in every single day. We reset the loop and then it starts again. And it's the same thing day in, day out. And, you know, thinking about, you know, the remedies that will cure COVID, which is, you know, people were saying, you know, if you drink ginger or put lemon and, you know. Um. <laughs> Into the next and this slide. light switch, you know, that you turn on and off every day um, just became a very repetitive yeah. Um, yeah. Let's talk about this one, increased exposure, which also is another pandemic reference, I would guess. Mm -hmm. So this sort of flower, ominous uh, creature type um, coming into the composition on the top right. Um, the background is actually uh, like a Chinese cabinet for uh, Chinese medicine mm. in the back. And then the figure in the back has all the sort of acupuncture points. And I was thinking a lot about, you know, this like thousand year old 
uh, healing tradition won't save us from this mm -hmm. um, virus. And um, this, this, uh, this dog creature actually is a reference to um, uh, this dog that was in Pompeii that was uh, frozen in time. Mm -hmm. And so it was, I think there was like an avalanche that was coming towards it and had just had frozen in this position. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought it was such a horrific, horrific image um, of this live animal, um, you know, thinking about us being frozen in this time while this, you know, we're in this pandemic. You know, the last year and a half really does feel like we've, it's been a pause and we're yeah. slowly coming back. Mm -hmm. um, and then hand fan. Yeah, so this was um, the first painting to the fan paintings in the current show. Um, this one was a, like a smaller study that I had done. And what had actually happened was I was planning to put two, I wanted to put the um, object in front of the, the subject it, and it was solid. But mm -hmm. as I was painting it solid, it didn't feel right. And what I did was I ended up wiping. I wiped the entire fan off and as I was wiping it, it did this beautiful blurring. Um, and in that moment, I knew that that's what I was looking for, was this sense of, you know, peering through, but you can't fully see through it. Um, and then so I just, I, I touched it up and then I took a, I took a large brush and I, I blurred it and, um, and I was like, Dominique, don't touch it, leave it. Um, and that's, that's, yeah, I left it. And um, then I subsequently made the, the other fan paintings. Right, which is, I mean, this one is such a, yes, here we go, um, bone holding fan. Um, I mean, what I really love about these paintings is, um, you know, to me, they seem to really tie into this idea of, you know, It's Not Polite to Stare, which is the title of your show now. Um, uh, so many of the works in this show are, um, I, I notice that the viewer is, is frustrated in an attempt to see through something that should be translucent or is being deflected in some way. Um, the looking is being deflected. Um, so um, you moved from the one from 2020 to this and the next one. Um, yeah. So I, I think for, for me, the Asian American experience really is, is, is that, right? I think a lot of it is that we're only shown in this very sliver of a, of a narrative. Mm -hmm. And so you're unable to see through, you're unable to, um, see all of us and I think for me what I was trying to grasp for in these in these works were this this idea of um being rendered invisible but it's so haunting that you so you can't look away so you want to look at it um but you can't fully see through it right. um and I think maybe there's also some agency in um deflecting these stairs. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think there is a, a bit of that. It's, it's putting these layers. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think two things, we can hold two, two ideas, right? And I mm -hmm. think um, it's a bit of uh, self-defense, but also, um, showing you how how uh, the yellow woman has really been rendered invisible. Mm -hmm. And is there a significance to um, the the statuary figures that are behind the fans in these paintings? Yeah, so the uh, 
so the previous one, I think I was just more referencing um, like a sculptural head, mm -hmm. uh, but the one after it is a direct reference to these uh, dancing fan, sorry, dancing figures. Um, and uh, I think it's been recorded in, in, in China that uh, dancing sculptures and, and dancing has been around for over 2000 years. And so for me, it's this sort of like historical um, art mm -hmm. that's been around for so long. Um, but then the fan overlays it and it renders it into this very like simplistic um, viewpoint of, uh, of how it's viewed. Right. Maybe we can talk about these smaller paintings that hang at um, the beginning of the exhibition because they sort of, um, they're sort of germination of an I of ideas that you see in the larger paintings. Yeah, so I think this painting and the painting after this are both um, reference to like very, very old, uh, I want to say like pa paleolithic fact check me. Um, <laughs> these objects that are so old. Um, right and thinking about how we as humans made these. Um, but in terms of the way that they're categorized in museums, the significance to them just feels like they're uh, sort of put off to the side, mm -hmm. whereas, um, you know, you see these 16th century, 17th century, 18th century works of art and they're placed, you know, very much in the center mm -hmm. of, of these institutions. Um, and, and for me, just thinking about like, why have we categorized in this way? Um, you know, when I had first started painting, um, you know, I don't come from a fine art background. I, you know, I come from a little offshoot of a suburb in Ottawa in Canada. And um, I had very little experience with looking at art. The, the only thing that I, you know, my, my parents had bought me this uh, uh, neoclassical book. Mm -hmm. And that was my only sort of reference to um, historical art. And so, um, when I then moved to Toronto um, and was able to travel a little bit more, you know, the first, whenever I went into these museums, the first places that I would go were to these like 16th century, 17th century paintings because I held them um, in such high prestige in my mind because this is what I've been reading. This is what I was taught. Um, these are the books that I had. Um, and it wasn't until I actually moved to uh, New York that I actually spent more time, um, you know, in the African section, in the indigenous sections, in the Chinese sections, the Japanese sections, in the South Asian sections, Southeast Asian sections. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, it's um, you know, I'm still thinking a lot about that. And I, and I want to paint more from these, uh, mm -hmm. like a wider, um, array of objects right and also these objects just interest me and um they excite me mm -hmm. yeah the glasses in particular i notice show up um frequently is there something about that as an as an object in particular that um that draws you what is it yeah i mean i think <laughs> it's i mean it's it is a little bit personal i mean i was i was uh six years old when I had to first wear glasses. And so my entire life I've had to wear glasses. Um, but for me, you know, putting on a pair of glasses, immediately everything comes into focus, right? And so by placing um, glasses in my work, I, I, I want to flip it back to the viewer to see that, you know, I'm in focus, like I'm focusing on you. I see that you're looking. Um, right. 
Um, and again, it's a little bit of the making fun of poking at tongue in cheek. Um, you know, being very aware that you're you're looking. Right, or being looked at maybe. Mm -hmm. I know you said that um, as a as a kid, you were you didn't have a lot of access to um, a broad spectrum of art. But was making art something that was always important to you, or um, did you come to it later? I've always been, since I can recall, I've always been drawing, doodling, painting. I first touched oil paint when I was I was twelve years old, and I was completely just enamored mm -hmm. and hooked. Um, yeah, it's been, I've always known that I was, I was gonna be an artist. I just didn't know per se that I would be, uh, I don't know, like a career artist or like, you know, an artist that would be making a living. Um, yeah. It wasn't in the in the realm of possibility for me. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, maybe we can move to the next one. And um, I mean, I think here would be um, a wonderful moment to talk about. We were talking a little bit the other day about your use of color um, and how you come to color. Um, to me, this is one of the supreme examples of um, your your beautiful use of color in these paintings and in the palette really across the show. Yeah, I mean, this is probably, um, I wanna say one of my first maroon purple paintings that I've done, um, purple yellow. I was actually speaking to an artist and she mentioned that I should try to use purple and, um, so more purple is going to come into the work, but this is this was my first attempt at at trying to include some of those uh, colors into it. I think the the two sort of figures in the back, I wanted it to be this very like golden mm -hmm. yellow, this presence uh, of of almost this history mm -hmm. in the background. Um, the two vases in the sort of, I don't know if they're called cabinets or like- um, Vitrines or- Yeah, like a vitrine almost. Um, I placed two of the vases in there. On the vase is actually a symbol uh, for double happiness. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, when I, when I was married to my partner, got married to my partner, we had the symbol um, behind us, it's 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 essentially two two characters combined. It's joy and joy, mm -hmm. and the two characters co come together to say double, like double joy, double happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and the blue petals for me is this sort of sadness. Um, I painted this right after the Atlanta mm -hmm. shootings, and so the there's, there's bullet holes in the in the train. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, this piece was really speaking to sort of how this uh, orient, like fetishization, this mm -hmm. um, orientalizing mm -hmm. can cause direct violence right. and direct death. Mm -hmm. um, even, even if, you know, like there's like a bear at the front, um, mm -hmm. you know, you think you're, you're protected, you think you're in a place that's safe. Mm -hmm. You're walking down the street, you're taking a subway, you think you're safe. Um, but because of the narrative um, and then the light that Asian Americans are being seen in, um, mm -hmm. you know, it can lead to violence. Mm -hmm. And even the term double happiness is one that I understand has been an um, appropriated, you know, in kind of thoughtless ways. By, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's it's been used in in various like kitsch forms, mm -hmm. um, you know, on on toys, on on mm -hmm. bags, and um, right. and so yeah, thinking a lot about uh, 
even just the character, how it's been used. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that your work is um, like overtly political, but do you think about this kind of thing when you're working or um, is it? Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah, you're right. I don't think my work is overtly political, but I think, um, you know, I, I read a lot about, I read a lot of news, um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly informed and I think a lot of that does seep into the work. Um, I, I, I don't often uh, directly speak to uh, like an, a, a direct uh, event mm -hmm. that's happened, but that one just really, um, you know, I like couldn't sleep and then I just, I didn't know what to do with, do with myself. And I felt like I needed, I needed to say something about it. And I needed to make work that directly spoke to that um, horrific, horrific racist mm -hmm. act. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is, yeah, again, the largest painting that I've done. Um, thinking about these sort of Roman Greek sculptures in the back and how there's this omnipresent um, way of, of looking at our history. I had actually read this really great article about um, the myth of whiteness in classical sculptures. I don't know if you've read the, the article. It's by uh, Margaret Tabot. Um, and she talks about how we have an assumption that these sculptures are actually marble and white mm -hmm. and how um, we've whitewashed actually uh, Roman and Greek history. And she says that these sculptures actually had uh, flakes of pigment on the sculptures and but when they're placed in museums they would actually scrub off hmm. all the color and so just thinking about what happens to us collectively when we see these sculptures in this sort of pure whiteness this marble when in actuality they all had color they were all of um you know the in the in the essay it mentioned uh, that that these sculptures at actually had various skin tones. So there was like variation in the skin tone and the eyebrows would be, you know, they would paint in the eyebrows and the eyes had different colors. And there's just an assumption that these sculptures of these people looked at and looked at specific, you know, the sort of Aryan race of, of these sculptures when in actuality they weren't. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking a lot about that and how this this uh, history gazes upon uh, groups of people, and so it's this I, I you know a frame within a frame. I made this this fish tank um, of this. That's actually this woman who. Uh, uh, there's this tradition in Korea and in Japan of these sea women that deep dive without um, uh, I don't know what they're called, respirators. Okay. And they just they just go down. They they uh, find um, oysters, sea urchins, and they bring them back up, and then that feeds like the village. And there's actually a village of these women that do that. And so thinking a lot about how um, you know people are just trying to exist, feed families, create, um, but there's this overarching um, dominant uh, sort of white supremacist mm -hmm. world happening outside of these, these people just trying to exist. Mm -hmm. I was really fascinated by this painting um, because there's just so much going on within it um, and then to have it also divided is another um, like it, it makes a, yet a whole nother set of um, of looking and reflection 
Um, and it made me think of this, um, as I was reading this quote that you said a couple of years ago in another interview, um, I really think this painting captures, uh, I think we are all on board with the problematic depictions of women and people of color in historical European paintings. Instead of using a completely different language to move away from it, I'm interested in using it to negotiate with the past. And I think this painting here with, um, you know, with these Greco-Roman sculptures, you know, gazing at the woman who's performing a, you know, a traditional fishing, you know, um, work, it really captures that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, it's, it's, um, I mean, even just thinking about language, you know, mm -hmm. like me speaking the English language and like a fixation on, you know, not having it in an accent, you know, growing up in Ottawa, being embarrassed of, you know, when my parents spoke, how they had an accent. And um, so using even language, using painting, you know, historically, you, the way that I'm painting, you know, I learned from, um, you know, painters like Vermeer, um, mm -hmm. Rembrandt. Mm -hmm. And so using these techniques, you know, Sargent, um, to be able to describe mm -hmm. um, these ideas and describe um, the experience um, mm -hmm. of a person of color in America. Um, yeah. Um, so, this, so this one's called social behavior and I was thinking a lot about how as, 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 as animals, mm -hmm. um, you know, the slight gaze of, you know, I'm just thinking about even walking my dog, when another dog looks at him in a just a slightly particular way, you know, he snaps or the other dog snaps. And so um, just thinking about how intrinsically in human nature and animal nature that that the way that we look at somebody is actually really important mm -hmm. um, because it can it can it can cause uh, physically a person to change right yeah the next one As, yeah and here we see again um, the the blurring. Um, I see this one sort of related in some ways to the fan paintings we looked at a little while ago. Yeah, I think for for these paintings, is I, I just wanted to to play with the sort of multi layered. Mm -hmm. uh, so much of some of the large paintings is like this sort of compartmentalizing of of different, you know, there's the, the figure in the bath and then there's the, the vase, there's the fish and there's the fan um, playing with this veneer, unable to like fully look through to see, um, And the largest and most formal meal of the day. I saw this as sort of um, almost a, uh, a new direction in within this body of work. Um, can you talk a little bit about this painting? Yeah, so I think... Um, it's also quite large, by the way. It's hard to get a sense of the, the scale, I think, from this particular slide, but um, it's quite a big painting, too. I, th I think... Um, you know, food is so food is so joyous. I think in every culture, uh, food just brings um, the sense of nostalgia of of you know these memories. Um, and I think the direction that I want to move the work towards is you know the probably the next 
last couple bodies of work is thinking about, you know, celebration um, and playing with, oh, let's go back. Uh, yeah, uh, playing with, with joy. I think food for me for a long time, uh, you know, I was very embarrassed by, you know, the foods that I grew up with because, you know, as, as, and an, I, it, this is not a unique story. Um, many, you know, immigrants have had this experience where your food is, is made fun of. Um, and so for me, it's an act of, uh, a celebrating it's a, an act of love mm -hmm. towards myself towards my community um and so you know there there's going to be more of you know these types of things mm -hmm. and the the character on the side who holds a cigarette um is that representative of something i noticed that the cigarette pops up in um other works throughout the show um like the glasses um it's a very yeah. distinct, uh, like an object that repeats. I think the cigarette for me represents. Um, so I think a lot of the, my work is is dealing with you know like my subconscious and conscious and and it it really is that in between and so I'm making works that are are of a of a place that's not completely fantasy but it's not grounded in complete exact. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, situations that are happening right now and so for me the cigarette is a little bit of like bringing that to like reality mm -hmm. right it's these vices that we have um that we need to keep going it's uh you know it's terrible for us um but we still keep doing it um, it's also a joy and a pleasure in the way yeah it's a joy it's a pleasure mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, and again with the glasses, I think um, I just I thought it was funny. Yeah, you know, I took the glasses off the philosopher and I I put it in the background. <laughs> so it's like you you see the philosopher, but you see that it's looking at you know they're looking at the glasses. Right. And you're looking at, um, and then there's just this like pulling of you know I have ideas um, right. out of out of these objects. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's very visceral in this painting, I think, that idea. Mm -hmm. And then like the, the chair in the back, I was thinking and referencing mm -hmm. uh, to these thrones yeah. um, that the kings and queens used to sort of sit on, but I displaced it a little bit. They're like fragmented. There's also um, like very elegant form and movement in this one. The um, the legs sort of mirror the little um, kind of amoeba form in the fold of the cloth down at the mm -hmm. front. Um, yeah, and just thinking about uh, playing with rhythm, playing with uh, the flow of the painting. I think for for me, when I when the viewer is looking at it, I really want you to sort of, it's a dance, right? Like you come in through the left, it brings you up top, then it brings you back down, then into the center, and then brings you back up. And so I want, I mean, there's a, there is a, uh, I mean, there's no specific way to look at it, but I think I, I want to draw you in in a specific way, if that makes sense. Yeah. And the cigarette again with the yeah cigarette <laughs> um yeah and again i think like a lot of these objects are are seen in a very specific way um and so for this the cigarette is the a little bit of a you know um snapping you out of it or i also uh, like the science of this painting it it's it felt very like um like this one has a little bit of moxie to it, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure, especially like the discarded, you know, yeah. it's hard to see in this image, but the, the yeah. sort of discarded mm -hmm. uh, cigarette butts. And, yeah. yeah. And then the next. 
And then I guess um, as we come to the end, maybe we can spend a little time talking about the sculptures, which are sort of a new um, a new medium for you, right? Yeah, they're uh, very, very new. Um, I've wanted to do, to do sculptures for a while. I uh, had a, many failed attempts and then I finally decided that for this exhibition, I was really gonna try to do, you know, like six to seven sculptures for it. I, um, yeah, they're still very fresh. Before? Had you worked in Yeah, I have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I joined a, 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 a pottery studio when mm -hmm. I first, when I moved here um, and then have been going to it on and off more for myself and just um, experimenting in different mediums. Um, I knew I wanted to somehow translate some of the paintings into like a three-dimensional mm -hmm. form. I just didn't know specifically how I was going to do it. And then uh, it made sense to do it for this show. And so there's a total of six, six sculptures. Um, and these are directly referenced to uh, a lot of the imagery that you see in the paintings. Right. And so, for example, like this is a direct. Uh, so these were all made uh, after the painting. Right. After the paintings. Mm -hmm. So they come from the paintings. And, and then, then I think the next phase of the work will be then referencing them back into the paintings. Right. And yeah. then the bird cages, you said you, you, where did they come from? They were sourced from variety of places. So they're, so they're all from here. Mm -hmm. I, the, the large ones from an estate sale from Pennsylvania. So I think for me, it's, it's just interesting thinking about how these objects have, you know, back to the same idea as, as these inst institutions like the Met, um, how they've come over here. We mm -hmm. don't really know too much about them. You know, I had asked the, the, the uh, owners, you know, where they just said China, mm. like, well, where, where from China? And they're like, we don't know. We've had this since like the 1950s. Yeah. The large ones from, they, they knew it's from the 1930s, but he couldn't really give me more information. Mm. Um, so, you know, know where exactly they were made. Um, I, I assume because there's a, a, a a love for these sort of uh, bird parks in Hong Kong and Guangdong. I think like they're probably more from from um, that area. I'm not I'm not sure, but uh, from what they told me from these estate sales, they they just said China. Yeah. Um, so that that for me is is interesting because uh, again this displacement. This one uh, particularly, you know, made from in the 1930s it's so beautiful um yes. the doors so like the 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 centerpiece that if you actually push it up the doors open so that you could put, right. put a bird in it um and it in and likewise in it's hard to see in this in this uh slide but when you come up close you've made really like a oh, it's almost a mobile within this mm -hmm. right and um and some of the objects I'm trying to remember, there's little knives, is that? Yeah, it's really hard to see in this picture, but uh, it's essentially dangling knives that are all pointed downwards with rose petals. Um, and I like that when it's, when it's hung and they actually slightly move. And uh, there's a, it, the piece is called Lay Your Head on My Pillow. And underneath is actually a fan and the fan, um, she's laying on this ceramic pillow, which uh, back in the day, I think the kings and queens would actually uh, commission these beautiful ceramic pillows for them to sleep on. Um, and so I made this ceramic pillow. Um, that's sort of under, it's under threat with, right. the, with the knives. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the whole idea of the birdcage really brings the exhibition full circle because it is just as an object, a thing that, you know, it's meant to be stared into um, mm -hmm. at, a, at a little kind of, you know, in traditionally a little decorative bird, um, which yeah, is actually yeah. 
simultaneously a, a living, breathing creature. And I think that- um, But we've, we've rendered it into an object, right? right. And it, it sits exactly. in your home. We particularly want like the bright birds, mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking about the way that we, the, the way that we treat animals mm -hmm. is very similar to the way that we treat people. Right. And um, just it's, for me, it was like a very um, like potent or, uh, symbol that kind of brought the whole show together. Um, and, and there it is in the final painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm the painting that started it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this slideshow. And um, if you're up for it, Dominique, um, we'd like to take some questions yeah. from the audience. Yeah, all right. Thank you both so much. This has been a wonderful run through of your current show and some of the works that you've done before as well, Dominique. So we had a question come in from David Coslow. Um, he unfortunately left, so I'll read his question for him. Uh, he asked, does the green you use in your paintings intentionally reference the celadon color found in Chinese ceramics? Uh, I don't think I'm directly referencing the celadon green, but I'm sh sure I think just in, in general when when you're you're painting so many of these objects, they just have a very specific color to them, and so uh, I'm sure a bit of that has translated through into the work. Um, I'm not necessarily um, directly referencing that specific green, though. So. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from our very own Nick Bennett. Hi, thank you, uh -oh. <laughs> Dominique and Jess. Sorry if you hear the dog in the background. Um, but I wanted to ask, uh, well, firstly, I kind of observed in looking at a lot of your paintings, Dominique, that um, a lot of these scenes sort of remind me of films or surrealism in some ways. And they make me kind of very aware of mise-en-scene as a tool in a way. Um, I'm just curious if you have certain favorite films or any films that sort of are really influential on your approach to painting um, and or if there are sort of any recent films you've seen that have kind of really that are still sitting with you or kind of just yeah. there with you when you're making the painting. Um, I recently watched House or Houseu by uh, Obayashi, um, Japanese filmmaker. Uh, it's this sort of campy um, film uh, where, you know, a group of uh, girls, you know, there's younger girls and women that go into this house and it's this haunted house and uh, it's very cryptic, but at the same time, uh, beautifully filmed and very strange, like the plot line just doesn't fully make sense and I love it. Um, little fingers that are playing the piano, just the fingers and uh, this woman that's looking in the mirror and it's of uh, an older version of her and a younger version of her and then it comes out. Um, and so, yeah, films like that, that just make absolutely no sense, but um, you can't stop watching. Um, you know, generally are the films that, that uh, I gravitate towards. Yeah, specifically that uh, recently. Um, uh, again, a lot of the um, Ghibli Miyazaki films. Um, I actually wanted to be an animator back in the day. I applied. I applied uh, for a Pixar internship. Didn't get it. Um, so now I'm here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like his. I, I feel like his storytelling is just. Um, there's so much allegory to his work, and, but at the same time, it's this, uh, this playful sort of dance that he does throughout the film with very strange like heads that bop onto mm -hmm. each other and 
dragons and it's literally everything. But at the end of the film, you're like, oh, okay, well maybe we should treat each other better and stop killing all the animals, you know? Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. Of course. Thank you, Nick. Next up, we have Catherine Olson. Catherine, you should be able to unmute. Yeah. Um, hi, thanks so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, I have another color related question. Um, there's sort of a dreamlike quality to the lighting and palette in your paintings. And I'd love to hear you speak more about what attracts you to that like tan sienna and like the blue green colors and then like the dreamy, almost theatrical lighting in the works. And then you also started to say like, you're kind of like toying around with purples. And I'm wondering if there's another color or palette that like you're planning to dive into next. So in terms of lighting, I think for me, I want the viewer to move through the painting in a very specific way. And so um, when I sort of like light, let's say uh, an object in the front and, the, and an object in the back, then your eye will naturally uh, go in those directions. So light for me is direction. Um, color then, ties all of that together. Because if you're just using light, then it might just be too uh, contrasted. And with color, then I, I can weave you into smaller stories within a larger, within the larger sort of uh, uh, direction that I want you to go in, if that makes sense. Um, and then in terms of colors that I'm thinking about, uh, definitely like the purple and, and uh, crimson was something that I, that I don't use a lot. And I think I want to use it more. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working up towards that. There's just, I think every artist has a very specific, you know, I have specific colors on my palette. Mm -hmm. I'm used to those colors. Every day I squeeze out those same colors. Um, and I'm trying to be more brave to, you know, now I'm putting the crimson in there and putting a purple in there, which I didn't before. Um, and then in terms of the, the, sort of earthy tones. Um, I think that just goes back to referencing these very old objects. I think naturally they just have this like warmer, earthier, maybe uh, blue, gray, green tone to them. And so the work just naturally um, drifted towards that direction. Um, but I think as I start to reference other things, the palette will move in that direction. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, our next question comes from GE Schwartz. GE, you should be able to unmute. Yes, thank you for this. It's so rich and wonderful and the colors and the images and everything. Um, I'm wondering though, is there any possibility, uh, Dominique, that you could perhaps share a little bit of the painting be behind you? Oh. It's so uh, mysterious, yeah. Sure, um, let me see if I can go close to Thank it. you. Um, it's called Birthday. I just finished it not too long ago. And her little, her hand, she's poking, poking at the... Now, I just added the raindrops in the back. I felt like it was missing something. Mm. That's beautiful. Giving Thank us you so much. Of, yes. Yeah. Preview. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dominique. Um, I have just one sort of last question. I was thinking about your story with a collector who thought that that IKEA blanket was some sort of silk gown. And yeah. I have an almost a visceral reaction to that. Uh, it also made me curious about whether do you aim for a more straightforward or accessible interpretation of your work, or it, is the quality of ambiguity important in your practice? And then another, just a sh very short question is, since we're coming out of this pandemic slowly, 
are there things that you've been relying on for escapism, like escapist literature or TV or movies? Just a fun question to wrap up this segment. Um, so I, th I think with my work, I wanna be able to hold all those things true. So I think directness is important, specificity is important, but also allowing play, allowing um, ambiguity, allowing um, maybe, yeah, allowing abstraction, right? Allowing all those things. And I think you could hold all those things true. I think you could say specific things with specific work. And I think there's work that allows you to sort of uh, maybe weave in and out of that. And then there's work that maybe you just don't want to say anything, you know, in specific. It could, or maybe you want to say many ideas. Um, and so I think uh, the way that I work in the language that I've built up um, with my images, it allows me to, to, to move through all those spectrums. Um, and then in terms of what I've been doing, I just finished um, Halston on Netflix. Oh, nice. <laughs> and I really enjoyed that. <laughs> um, yeah. Awesome. I've heard really good things about it. I so, enjoyed it thoroughly, uh, yeah. Moving to poetry, at the rail we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Ty Cooper, to the stage. A graduate from Pratt Institute, writer Ty Cooper writes in experimental prose, poetry, and digital language art. They are currently a production assistant at the Brooklyn Rail. Ty, take it away. Thank you, Jess, and thank you, Dominique and Jessica, for today's conversation. It's been really, really amazing to hear you guys talk about these works. Um, today, I'm going to be reading from uh, my novel in progress, Earth is Planet. I'm going to read three short sections. Earth is a Planet is a study in distance and dissonance, both internal and external, and is told through the narration of three bodies, uh, Opportunity, the now defunct Mars rover, a woman named Genevieve, and I hand an autonomous armless hand. So you're going to be hearing from those three respectively. Opportunity, Descent. I am born, like most things, with fire and a collision, softly. I come into a planet alone, as all children do, and I fall gently through the air as I breathe. I arrive into Red, and I know that this puts me closer and farther from my mother's other children, who arrived out of Red and were cleaned. I begin myself blank and cover me in sand as the days go by. I grow limbs as I need them and give my eyes to my mother for her use. We never stop talking, my mother and I. We need each other. She uses my eyes to tell me where I am and I use her, my hands to tell her what it's made of. We do each other's bidding, my mother and I. I do everything for her and she does everything for me and we do nothing for ourselves except the talking. I've been talking, I've been thinking, I've been trying to think. When everything you know has been taught to you by someone else, how much of that knowledge is yours to claim? My mother tells everyone I will live for 90 days and our first secret is how strong I am. We collect knowing and we leave everything else where it started. And when I get lonely, I remind myself to remember that we are each other. I am never only myself and she would not leave me unattended. My mother made me special to last and on my 91st day, there is no party. Dream sequence, Genevieve. I want these mountains to be red. I want these mountains to be red. I want her to be red. I want these mountains red in the moon. I want her to remind me that our hair gets long together. I want the mountains to be red. I want her to be red. I want these mountains red in the moon. I want her to be red. I want to look up and not see the... Maeve takes the moon and puts it in the back of the van with me. We drive through the pitch black until it becomes morning and we pull over. Me and the woman I clean my apartment for, carrying the moon. It belongs at the bottom of the cliff, next to the river, and we'll put it there. But then someone else must have taken it, or it got pulled back to the sky, or the river took it, because now it's just me and Maeve, standing, facing the cliff. A mother pulls up next to us in some sort of station wagon with two small children. 
I am holding a photo and the woman I clean my apartment for is upset. One of the children, a girl, hands me a stretched circle of cloth, which I know she is telling me to pull over my shoe and onto my ankle. I do. Maeve is surprised and upset and I can't tell if I made the right choice and her voice shakes as she tells me it's best to keep it on. She is terrified. The mother, walking towards the cliff, turns around and begins to glitch as the children hold each of her hands, flanking her as she flashes. Her eyes go red and too long, and she is stretching and compressing, stretching and compressing and deforming, deteriorating. I know about black holes and what happens when a body falls in. This is the kind of pity that will never be stronger than its fear. I wake up sweating and too still and wait for the shape of the mother's glitched body to fade from its place in my closet. I am careful not to wake the maid that sleeps next to me. Two hands, building. I hand am making soggy sand castles and getting knocked over by salt. I fall palm first against the outer walls of the roofless dune and feel the grains rearranging themselves against my palm. I hand wobble myself on my heel, left to right, hopping myself around the sand circle that I have made. I repeat this process on the inside. I know hand is laying on the inside of our sunlit sand cave sunbathing, and every time I build the wall up higher, the top few grains collapse in onto her palm, and she re rearranges herself to slide them off. When she turns onto her front, the crescents of her nails are brown and gray with sand, and her office thinar is speckled. I use my thumb to slide the spots from her skin, and she performs a small movement, which means either thank you or have you seen the ocean lately? I hand am entering the ocean and I know hand is entering with me. We become weightless as soon as the tide comes in and this makes it difficult to walk. There is a small moment upon entry at which a death or at least a sinking feels inevitable and approaching quickly. This small moment of panic is experienced in present tense as a deep bodily fear, but is immediately diminished to an inconsequential anxiety once I hand regulate the body as a water vehicle a wave motion, a dive of the fingers towards the colder deep and a return to the surface. This motion being entirely different from a walking motion, the body requests some adjusting. I know hand floats next to me and I hand dive under and around, full of vibrating blood in a motion that I am using to say I love, but might look more like I am, which is close enough. Thank you. Wow, that was incredible. Thank you, Ty. And thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Jess. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today for all of your questions. And join us Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation between Barbara Bloom and Tom McGlynn. We'll conclude with a poetry reading from Diana Hamilton. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye um, as you leave. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dominique. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Jess. Thank you very much, Ty. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you so much. It was wonderful.